Is it on? Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's full and ready to hear some the word. Uh, we're going to take prayer requests up first. Uh, I've got Elmer Woody and Liv on here, and I've got Bill and Jewel Meadows. Does anybody else have anybody that needs prayer? Dave and Lisa Martin. Anybody? Yes. Do what? Mike Branch. Yes. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear kind, heavenly gracious, we just, Father of ours, we just thank you and praise you for letting us come back again to, to your house, dear Heavenly Father, to praise you. We've got several prayer requests, dear Heavenly Father. You heard what that, they were, dear Heavenly Father, and I know you know their needs, dear Heavenly Father, and, and what they need. Uh, I just ask you just continue touching Elmer Woody and just blessing him, dear Heavenly Father, and just touching his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And be with Lib, dear Heavenly Father, and just give them a peace and take the worry away because worry is a, is a tough thing, dear Heavenly Father, and I know it's hard not to do. And, uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just ask you to be with our pastor, dear Heavenly Father, and Karen, and just if they're heading back and forth, to give them travel mercy and give them a peace and a comfort, dear Heavenly Father. And be with uh, Billy and Jewel Maddox, dear Heavenly Father. They're healing from a wreck they were in, dear Heavenly Father, because I know you can heal them up, dear Heavenly Father. It's going to take a little time, but I just ask you to be with them, touch and minister to them, dear Heavenly Father, and get them back, dear Heavenly Father. And David and Lisa Martin, you know what that need is, what she's going through with that cancer she has, dear Heavenly Father. But the doctors can say that, but you can take it away, dear Heavenly Father. And that's what we're asking in the name of Jesus, that you just heal them up, dear Heavenly Father, and take that away from her. And be with David and give him a peace, dear Heavenly Father, and comfort, dear Heavenly Father, as only you can give. And dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with Lucille Collins. She's not been feeling well for a couple of weeks now, and I, I just ask you just to put a touch there, dear Heavenly Father, because you're the great physician, dear Heavenly Father. You're our everything, dear Heavenly Father, and I just know you can touch her and heal her up. And dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with Mike Branch. You know what that need is there, dear Heavenly Father, that, what that touch is that he needs, dear Heavenly Father. And I just ask you to bless him and touch him and minister to him, dear Heavenly Father. And Caitlin, dear Heavenly Father, you know what she needs, dear Heavenly Father. I just ask for a special blessing upon her, dear Heavenly Father. You, you'll just touch her and minister to her, dear Heavenly Father. And, and you know what that need is better than I do, dear Heavenly Father. And I just ask you to be with her. God protect and direct her and keep her safe. And, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to keep all those that are sick and afflicted, that you'll just touch them and minister to them. And Dear Heavenly Father, just put a special blessing upon them, dear Heavenly Father. I ask you to pull up the heartstrings of the lost, dear Heavenly Father, that they'll just draw them to you, dear Heavenly Father. And someone out there that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I hope tonight's tonight they get their salvation, dear Heavenly Father, because we don't know when we're going to take our last breath, but we need to be ready now. And I just ask you to be with them, dear Heavenly Father. And we thank you for your son who went to that cross at Calvary and shed his precious blood to cover our sins. I ask you to be with the service today, dear Heavenly Father. Hide Brother Paul behind the middle cross, dear Heavenly Father, and let our ears hear and our hearts receive that word, and let, it, let us apply that to our lives, dear Heavenly Father. And let us be that vessel we need to be, dear Heavenly Father. Use us to go out of these walls and tell everybody about our Lord and Savior. And, and just say a, a good word to somebody, dear Heavenly Father. might lift them up, dear Heavenly Father. And I just ask you to be with each and every one of us through these holidays. Uh, and we're going to give you praise, honor, and glory for everything said and done. Jesus, sweet holy name, I pray. Amen. All right, if I can uh, have the youth to come up. And where's Brother Robbie at? There he is. Y'all pray with me as we pray over these young people. <clears throat> Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you humbly as we know how, Father. We thank you, Father, for our young people. Father, we thank you, Father, for each class that you provided. Lord, we thank you for this church that allows us to break out in small groups and, and take these young people and teach them your word, Father. Lord, just help us to be a... a, a where we need to be, Father. Give us a word that needs to be instilled in, uh, upon them, Heavenly Father. And, Lord, I just pray, Father, Lord, that you would make them the witnesses that they need to be everywhere they go, Father. Lord, outside the church walls, Lord, in school, 
wherever they are, Father, we just pray, Lord, a hedge of protection around them, Father. And, Lord, we just ask you to use them, Father, to reach those that we can. Father, just share that experience they have with those around them, Father, and just use them to the furtherance of your kingdom, Father. Lord, we just ask you now to have thine own way. Be with us. Watch over us and keep us safe. And we're going to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Congregation, congregational song. Everybody will stand. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Have some ushers, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be back here tonight, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in people's lives, Lord. 
Lord, we just ask you to be with all the ones that have been mentioned that's been sick, Lord. Lord, we just ask everything will be worked out in your will and your time, Lord. We just thank you for it. And Lord, as we take up this offering tonight, Lord, we just ask it to be used for the building of thy kingdom. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We got a special tonight. Should I 
Well, I'm glad you come back this evening. I didn't finish this morning's message. I don't know what happened. I got a little distracted. But uh, so I'm going to share it with you just tonight because it's going into the, uh, the sermon for tonight. But uh, the last thing I was supposed to tell you was number three, your devotion has to change. And if you don't come along to a place where you would like God's will to be done in your life, you're going to have a hard time having a good relationship with God. And uh, I kind of needed to say that. I don't know if I got that out this morning. I don't think I did. I was sitting there at the house, and I was like, huh, I didn't preach that third point the way I was supposed to. But anyway, so that's the way it goes. And um, sometimes I guess the Lord has other things. I'm going to blame it on him. Uh, but uh, I don't know if that's accurate because sometimes we can do things wrong, right? A lot of times we blame things for God that he has no business in. But uh, take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter number 51 tonight. As uh, we're going to look in the scriptures and uh, the, the point that uh, I was bringing up this first, uh, the first one this morning was about being repentant. Anytime we go contrary to God, in order to get ourselves in a right relationship with God, there has to be repentance. And uh, tonight I'd like you to take your Bible and look in Psalms chapter 51. And we're going to look at what does repentance look like God's way. I don't know if you've ever done something and then wish you hadn't. Generally, after I do something that I wish I hadn't, the next thing that I, I wish is I hope I don't get caught. I remember a lot of times doing things that my parents didn't want me to do. I wasn't sorry I did it. I just hoped I didn't get caught. Sometimes we get that way with God. We just hope that the consequences aren't going to be there. And, um, and so we'll apologize for things. Uh, have you ever had somebody's... I love it when this happens. That's a little bit of sarcasm there. When somebody's kid does something that they're not supposed to, and then the parent says, you go apologize for that. <laughs> I saw that recently, and, um, um, I, and I leaned over to my wife because one mother said to her child, you go to apologize to the other mother for, for what you were doing. And it was because it affected her child. And I turned to my wife and I said, the mother is who should be apologizing to the mother, not the kid. The kid doesn't know any better. It's the mom who didn't do. And, uh, and so we come along and we get this idea of, of what, is it, what does it mean to be right with God? Because in John chapter number 1, verse number 9, it's a really famous verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if... Depending on your heart attitude, your attitude is, well, as long as I just confess it, everything will be okay. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Lord, I'm sorry I shouldn't have done this. There we go. We're good, God, right? And uh, now I'm back good with God, and I can keep living the way I am, happy as a lark. In Psalms chapter 51, we believe that this passage was written um, in David confessing before God the sin with Bathsheba. I think all of us know it, but I'll give you a, a brief rundown of what took place, there was a time when the kings went out to battle. Now, that's really contrary to the way we think. But there was a certain time. I don't doesn't specify there how often that was when all the kings would go out with their armies and be like, all right, we're going to prove who's the biggest and who's going to take over who, and we're going to establish some new boundaries for city-states. It'd be like Carthage and Vass and... Camera and all saying, all right, we're going to fight, and whoever's the win winner on this is going to get more land or tax other cities and those kind of things. And David chose not to go out and lead his nation in that. Perhaps David had gotten soft as king. I don't know what the situation was, but he sent his chiefest of generals out in his stead. While he was back in his castle, I'm going to call it a castle, in his house, enjoying things, he looked out of his window, and lo and behold, there was Bathsheba on the rooftop taking a shower. He looked at that enough, long enough, that he said, you know what, I think I'm going to invite her over to the house. The Bible is very discreet in what takes place. It doesn't talk about all the, the details, other than the fact that Bathsheba sends word to David, I'm pregnant. That ought to be enough to tell you what took place, all right? Doesn't matter how it happened, that's what took place. So Bathsheba happens to be married to a fella by the name of, help me out, 
What's his name? Say what? I still can't hear. Who was Bathsheba married to? Uriah. There we go. So Uriah sends Uriah in, and, and Uriah says uh, he, he comes back with word about what's going on, and David's trying to be sly about this whole situation. They didn't have 23 and Me that time, right? The DNA testing and all that stuff. And so uh, David's like, Sav, Uriah, come back. Uriah comes in and says, hey, Uriah, tell me what's going on in the battle. Uriah gives a story. He's like, fantastic. You go home and, uh, and have a good night, and I'll give you word and send you back out. Now, Uriah, a man of, I, I think they had a party there first is what they did. He got him drunk, sent him home, and Uriah didn't go home. So then next night, he's like, look, you, you go home, spend time with your wife, and then go back out to battle. And Uriah still looked around and said, look, my men are out there in battle. How in the world can I go home? To my wife, I'm just not a suitable general. I can't do that, so I'm going to stay right here and sleep, and then I'll go back out. In any case, it was probably God's plan working in David's life, but Uriah would not go home and spend the night with his wife. David is now stuck. How am I going to solve this problem? So David, in his brilliance, comes along and says, well, the only thing I know to do is to kill the guy. Now, it's kind of interesting. When you think about David and all the things that David did, God says that David was a man after God's own heart. And when you look at David's life, I love David. I haven't killed anybody. But anyway, uh, I love David's life because I can relate to it in so many ways. That's why I thought I'd tell you that I haven't killed anybody. But anyway, um, because David was a fellow who messed up immensely, and yet God still said, this is a man after my own heart. Now, I think that had two meanings to it. One, God chose David, but also see that David was a repentant and sought after God even in his mistakes. He was still looking for the mercy and the love of God even when he knew he was an abject failure. Now, with that aside, David comes along and David says, well, the only way I know how to solve this problem is just to kill Uriah in battle. And so he devises a plan. He says, I tell you what, <clears throat> I want you to take Uriah and his men, put them out there in the very front of the battle. When it gets really hot, I want you to back up. Now, any general who was looking at that plan knew exactly what David was trying to do. The other generals went out there, set it up, put Uriah up there in the front, backed away. Sure enough, Uriah died in battle. Problem solved. Whew, glad we got that taken care of. There's only one problem with that, God. And when we live our lives, a lot of times we forget that what we do in secret is not a secret to God. Many times we forget that. We get ourselves crosswise with God. And what the interesting thing about God is, is that you can say right now, in this very moment, you can say, God, what is there in my life that should not be? And if you will say that right now in your heart to God, God will immediately bring to mind what it is. That's how God works. He's an amazing God. He knows you from the inside to the outside, and he'll speak to your spirit just as fast as you ask him that question. Now, what we see here with David is that God used all kinds of interesting stories to work with David. So God sends a prophet by the name of Nathan to him and says, here's what we're going to do. You go, tell Nathan, you go tell David this story, and let's see what happens. I can't imagine being Nathan and having this story to tell David, knowing full well, because God reveals to Nathan what David has done. And so Nathan comes along and tells the story. He says, David, he said, I got a story I need you to some judgment on, and I wonder if you'll help me out. He says, I got this rich guy. He has all these sheep, and right beside him is this poor guy who only has one lamb. Let me tell you, this lamb is precious to him. It's special. He, this lamb comes and sleeps with him in his own bed. I mean, this lamb is special to this guy who's poor. And the other guy had a guest coming in to stay at his house, and he needed to feed him, and he didn't want to use one of his lambs, and so he chose to kill this other man's lamb. David was like, oh, my goodness. How in the world could a guy be so unthoughtful? Began to pronounce judgment on him. Nathan looked at him and said, God's told me you're that man. And the problem is, is David can't get away from the Spirit of God convicting him of his sin. And what we do with that 
situation in our lives, when the Spirit of God convicts us, is what determines, I think, whether or not you are a person after God's own heart or not. In other words, do you want to have a right relationship with God? And so Psalms 51 here is the prayer of repentance of David. And it says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. And I want you to see what, God, what David here is saying about when he's asking for mercy. A lot of times when we ask God for mercy, we ask God specifically what we want God to do in our lives. And what happens here is that David is not asking for that. David is saying, Lord, I want the mercy according to your love. You have to understand, and I'm pretty sure this took place after, David had learned a lot of things about the mercy of God. It was David who had sinned, who had numbered the people. He came along and he was concerned about how well the nation was going to do in battle. He numbered the people. And so he had set up and he's like, all right, I feel pretty good going against the Philistines or the Amaleks or the Amorites or whoever it was that he was going to go fight because I've got this many soldiers, they have this many soldiers. I think we got them. David didn't want him living that way. David, excuse me, God didn't want David or any king living that way. He wanted the kings completely dependent upon God. I have no idea how many people are showing up for battle, but what I know is God is on my side. And if God is for me, what was the phrase that came along that people learned? Who can be against me? We learned that back with Joshua. God is for me. Who can be against me? I'm not worried about it as long as God is on my side. That's how God wants us to live with no fear, trusting completely in God as our protector, as our defender, as the one who will lead us through the difficult circumstances. And so David had, in David's um, counting the people, God judged him and God gave him three different things that could happen. Either he was going to have pestilence or either he was going to have um, <clears throat> a, another nation rule over them or God was going to kill them. Then go through with a plague and kill the people. And, God, and David said, you know, I, I don't trust the people. The, the best thing I can do is fall under the mercy of God. That's the best thing that could happen to me, is, is people don't have mercy. And to see that, and you can go back and look at different prophets. You can look at Jonah. We just finished with the book of Jonah, where what happened with this great city of Nineveh that God was going to destroy? Did God destroy it? No, because of his mercy. And so David knew of that, and so when he comes along and he begins to pray to the Lord, who he has sinned against, he says, Have mercy upon me, how according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, Lord, blot out my transgression." God, I have sinned, and here's one interesting thing about sin. Only God is, poss is capable of making that go away. See, we have a hard time relating to that in life. Because, like, when we hurt people, say you say something that you should not have said, you can apologize for it, but you know what you can't do? You can't unsay it, right? Right? The pain is still being inflict inflicted. When we come along with God, this is what's amazing with God. God can make your sin as if it never happened. What a merciful God. Right? And so here we see this in this verse where he says, Lord, I need you to blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What you see here with David is David takes ownership of what he has done. You see this in his repentance. Lord, I need your mercy and I need you to wash me from mine iniquity and cleanse me from, the next word there, see that? My sin. He's not trying to sugarcoat this with God. He's not trying to hide it. When I've, when I've talked with people who are angry and bitter towards God and I, I'm like, look, you just need to tell God exactly how you feel. He already knows you ought to tell him. Let God hear your voice. You talk to God about exactly how you feel towards God. 
He already is aware of it. David comes along, he's like, Lord, I have sinned and I need you to wash me from it. Look in verse number three. For I acknowledge my transgression. If you want to be right with God, you're going to have to confess that what you have done is a violation of what God expects from you. That's genuine repentance. I have made a mistake. What have I done? Well, I just messed up. No, that's not what you've done. What is your sin? I acknowledge I have sinned against you, God. As we look here in this passage, you see what he says. We, we learn some new things here in verse number four. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. Sometimes when people find out that you're a Christian, they will, they will begin to apologize. They'll say things, and they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm pretty quick to tell them, you don't need to apologize to me. I'm not your judge. It's God that you need to stand before. I have a fellow that I work with, and he is a pretty strong testimony of being a Christian in the workplace. He's talking to all of us, and he's carried on this conversation, and something was said, and he's like in exasperation, and he's like, Jesus Christ. And I stopped him. I was like, hey, I said, that's my Savior you're talking about. He said, I'm sorry. Now, I don't know if he was apologizing to me or apologizing to God, but I was like, it's not me you're supposed to be apologizing. You're taking God's name in vain. The only reason I bring that up is as a Christian, God says that he will not hold us guiltless for taking his name in vain. And so when we come along and we begin to talk about God and talk to God, the only person we sin against is God. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because sometimes we feel like people sin against us and hurt us. They might do you wrong, but they've not sinned against you. You don't have any moral authority over them. You know why? Because you're a sinner. What I'm getting at is that we need to come to a place, I'm going to have to go get this, uh, we need to come to a place of forgiveness, of being able to forgive people who have wronged us, not because we have some moral authority, but because we have no place to stand above them. The only person they've sinned against is the righteous and holy God. And I just say that to help you to deal with situations where people have done you wrong and you are having a struggle with, with coming to the place of forgiving them and realizing that, look, you've sinned against an almighty God too. As we look here in verse number four, against thee the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear. Look at this, when thou judgest. Now there's an interesting thing that takes place in this story. David ends up marrying Bathsheba. They have a child together. And then God strikes the child with an illness. And David begs God, puts on sackcloth and ashes. God, I'm begging you for this child's life. Can you imagine what David is praying? God, this child didn't do anything wrong. I'm begging you to save this child's life. Guess what? The child dies. And all the people are over here that, that know this, and they're whispering amongst themselves. You'll find this, I think it's in the book of Samuel. And, and David perceives, hmm, the child must have died. David goes back, and they didn't want to tell him. They're like, man, if he's this bent out of shape about the child dying, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine what he's going to do when he finds out that the baby has died. Finally, David asks, and he finds out, yes, the child is dead. David puts his clothes back on. David understands something about God. God judged David's sin. Here's this situation, and sometimes we think that we sin in a bubble and that our sin doesn't affect other people, but it does. Our relationship with God affects other people, and so... Here this child dies, and here's David who's saying, Lord, 
You are righteous when you judge. And it's important for us to understand that just because we sin and we ask God for forgiveness, and I don't know where this takes place, this forgiveness and repentance of God, of David, in relation to the God's judgment, whether he came to this place after or before, but, but it's important to realize that there's still consequences for our behavior. There's still consequences for what we do. Even if there's repentance, there might be, you can be 100% right with God for what you've done in the past. You can be, there's no such thing. I'm going to say it this way. There's no such thing, I don't know if you've heard this before, as God's permissive will. When I was growing up, I heard that there's God's perfect will. And then, if you mess that up, there's God's permissive will down here. In other words, here's what God really wants of you, but you can so mess that up that then now is there's this permissive will of God. And I thought about that, and I began to study the Scriptures, and I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make no sense at all. In other words, what you're saying is you have to live perfectly, and then if you don't live perfectly, down below here is all this other area that you can live. I was like, I haven't met anybody who lives perfectly. Every, if that's true, everybody's living in the permissive will of God. They're like, no, 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 there's some sins that just put you down. You can't be up here where God wants you to be. I don't find that to be true in the Scriptures. I find that God says that all sin, you can have a perfect relationship with God regardless of what you've done in your life. That's the amazing mercy and the goodness of an almighty God. Think about that. Because God is forgiving us when we come to him in forgiveness. And when you look at this, and a lot of people will say, well, God can't use me. And they'll begin to name off of reasons why God can't use them. Really? Because I think I saw here David killed somebody. Was committing adultery before that? I mean, you know, if we're going to start hierarchical sins, I mean, that's kind of up there for sins, isn't it? Right? Moses? Yeah, he killed somebody too. We begin to look at these different people's lives, and you look at Samson. Here was Samson who was called of God. He was going to be a judge. Part of what his life, purpose in life was to break the Philistines' hold on the nation of Israel. God was judging the nation of Israel because they weren't making God a priority in, in their nation. And God said, all right, I'm going to allow the Philistines to come and to, to overrun your land. And they're going to start taking the things that you are growing and all these different kind of things and, and, and rule over you. And God said, I'm going to raise up a guy who's, who's going to be able to destroy them. Before Samson was ever born, God said, here you go, Samson. You're going to be a Nazarite. His parents knew that, and so he was following the Nazarite vow. And that was the things that they would never drink uh, wine. He would never cut his hair. These were symbols of the vow that he had with God. And yet when you look at Samson's life, he got all messed up with Delilah, ended up in prison by who? The Philistines. And yet, when he began to come back and, and his hair began to grow and all this stuff, he was like, Lord, give me one more opportunity to be used of you. You know the end of Samson's life, right? His eyes had been gouged out. There was all kinds of consequences of him rejecting the vow that God had given him. But in the end, God still allowed him and gave him phenomenal strength like he had given him in the past. If you read all the stories about Samson, Samson was killing Philistines like crazy. God gave him the strength to push down some pillars where the Philistines were having a big party. There's an interesting couple of words in the passage where that takes place, and it says this, Samson killed more Philistines in his death than all the time that he was fighting. That was his purpose in life that God had used him for. And yet here, despite his life and how he had lived, in the end, God still gave him uh, a, a purpose and allowed him to, 
to be right with God, and God blessed him with the amazing strength that he'd had at the beginning because it was all supernatural. So here's David, and David is looking for a righteous and holy God. He's lived in sin. In verse number 5, he says this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here's some interesting things about God that we learn in the Bible, is that you're born sinners. It's not that I was... I use this illustration sometimes. Where every one of us are 100% completely selfish, and all you got to do is go back and talk to your parents about what you were like when you were born. Here, your mother just gave you birth, and what is the first thing you do? You didn't care how tired she was. You hollered and screamed until you got fed every couple of hours, right? Those of you who've had children know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, man, this kid doesn't quit. Every time it gets hungry, he's going to holler or she's going to holler until she gets fed. That was every single one of us. It doesn't matter. And this is all I'm bringing up is that we were purely selfish from the very beginning of our lives. Why? Because we were born in iniquity. It is a, it is a part of us in our nature. We see that in verse number 5. But in verse number 6, he says this, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part thou shalt make me to know Wisdom. If we're going to be right with God, we've got to be completely honest on the inside. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you. Doesn't matter what, what you think of yourself. You've got to be honest on the inside with God. God already knows your heart. And in verse number 7, he says this, purge me with hyssop. Now, the word hyssop is an interesting, it's, it's a bush um, that is used in the scriptures. The very first time hyssop is used, You'll find it in the book of Exodus. When Israel was going through the tribulations of being slaves in Egypt, and God was getting ready to bring them out, and one of the last plagues that was on the nation of Egypt was that of killing the firstborn. And God had provided a, a reprieve for the Israelites. They were not under these plagues. But this plague was going to be on everybody who did not follow the word of God. And God said, I'm going to kill the firstborn, and the only way to do it is that you're going to have to kill a sacrifice. A lamb's going to be, have to be sacrificed. And I want you to take, you ready for this? Hyssop and dip it in the blood of the animal who died, and you're going to have to use that to mark the mantle, the door, the, the um, what would we call that today? Brother Mike, what do we call that other door? What's the door? The door frame, right? You're going to have to, you're going to dip the hyssop in the blood and you're going to mark your door and that's what's going to be salvation for you, for the firstborn in your home. The hyssop was used. Throughout the, the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus, God uses and specifically says, I want you to take hyssop and I want you to dip it in blood. And that blood is applied for your, ready for this, forgiveness. And so David is referencing that when he comes back here. Purge me with his, Lord, I need to be under the blood. And this was a foreshadowing, foretelling of, I'm not sure which one I should, should be using there, of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. You know what the Bible says? From all sin. That without the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sin, we are not washed. And David knew that he needed to be washed and clean before God. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be, look at this, whiter than snow. What a testimony of David. He understood the goodness of God. He said, God, the only way that I can be 100% pure and holy before you is if you wash me. You know what you don't see here with David? You don't see David trying to do some good work to make it better. David understands he has complete reliance upon God if he's going to ever be right with God. What I'm trying to say is you can't get yourself good works won't get you right with God. We see that specifically if we've got a few minutes to get there. I hope we will. It says in verse number 8, look at what happened in David's life. Make me to hear joy and gladness. I, I briefly alluded to this, that sometimes difficulty comes into your life because it's the judgment of God. The joy and gladness was gone in David's life. 
And the only way he was going to get it back was to get in a right relationship with God. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones, look at what this says, which thou hast broken may rejoice. He recognized that God had broken him. Why? For his sin. And he was like, Lord, the only way I can get this fixed is if you'll wash me and make me clean. In order for me to ever have joy in my life, in order for me to ever experience real happiness, I'm going to have to have you. I, I need your washing. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. You blot it out. Have you ever seen anybody? I, I go back. I don't never watch him, but I have seen a, him sometimes. Who was the big-haired guy? Bob Ross? You ever watch him paint? Every now and then, I didn't ever, I never like actually watched a show, but occasionally he would be on PBS and we'd stop for a few minutes and watch it and sometimes he would blot. He kept blotting until, and I thought it was interesting, even though I don't like painting, that in the course of 10 or 15 minutes of him just kind of blotting away, you're like, oh, looky there, now there's all trees. What once was just something I didn't recognize now is completely different. And so David is asking God to blot out his iniquities. In verse number 10, it's interesting to see here where he said, created me a clean heart. You know what the problem is with our heart many times? The Bible says it in the book of Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And what we need from God is we need for God to create a clean heart in us. Sometimes it's difficult to acknowledge, yes, my heart is wicked. I don't know where I picked this up. It's not a good, good phrase, but I like it occasionally because it helps us understand where we are. You know when, when uh, we say, God bless you, and people sneeze? Sometimes I would say, God bless your poor wicked soul. <laughs> and usually that kind of threw people off, right? Well, <laughs> it's true. You need to acknowledge that you have a wickedness inside of you, and the only way we can be righteous is through the washing that we receive under the blood of Jesus Christ. Creating me a clean heart, God, and renew a, look at this, right spirit within me. A right spirit. Your spirit. I don't know. The best way I know how to explain your spirit is your spirit's what is going on in your brain. We, a lot of times, at least I used to think my spirit was somewhere down in here. But really, your spirit's right up here. And you can have all kinds of conversations. You can have a conversation with yourself. That's your spirit talking to your spirit. You can have a, a conversation with God, your spirit talking to God. You can have a conversation with the devil. People open themselves up all the time to the devil, whether it's through Ouija boards or there's lots of ways that you can open up yourself and say, man, I want to have some kind of relationship with the devil. He's real. He likes to put thoughts in my head. He'll talk to me. He'll tell me what a sorry, rotten individual I am. He can bring up everything I've ever done in the past that I don't want to remember. He's capable of being like, hey, remember when you did that? I'm like, devil, what are you doing reminding me of that? I've asked God for forgiveness, but he'll still bring it up, try to tell me what a sorry individual I am. That's the spirit of the devil talking to you. So the, to understand your spirit is to understand what we call your thinking. And sometimes the problem is we have stinking thinking. Our thinking, right, a lot of times if you don't control your thinking, your thinking will go all kinds of places. A lot of times when you lay your head down to sleep, you'll have a hard time going to sleep. You know why? Because you've got stinking thinking. Now, sometimes, I know this is with women especially, sometimes you've got this warehouse of ideas that's going on in your mind, and when you lay down, you're just looking at all of them. Us guys, most of us have it easy. All of our ideas exist in individual boxes. And we're like, let's close all these boxes. That's dumb. I don't want to think about all those things. We got one box left right before we go to sleep. You know what's in it? 
nothing. That's how come we go to sleep so fast. You ladies are sitting there thinking about all these kind of things. So our thinking has to get fixed. Sometimes you can ask forgiveness for God, but the problem is you don't have good thinking. So even though you're sorry you did wrong, you're still thinking about whatever it is that you do wrong. Your desire is still for those things. And David recognizes that, and so he says, Lord, I need a right spirit within me. Verse number 11, he says, Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now, I love that verse, not at all because of what it is, but because of the other ways in which I can apply it to being born again, and that is this. When I'm saved, I'm not saved. God saves me. Let me tell you the difference. It's his salvation, not mine. Let me tell you why that's significant. I can't lose it. It's not mine. It's his. So when I'm born again, the only way for me not to be born again is if God chooses to no longer save me, which would make him a liar, which he has said, I am not. In verse 16 of John chapter 3. What does he promise if we believe? I know you all know the verse. I'm going to wait until somebody says it. What was the first word? Everlasting. Now, either something is forever or it's not. There isn't an in-between. You can't have something and then not have it if it was everlasting. Otherwise, it was never everlasting. You know what I'm saying? It's simple English. It's not that hard, but I think sometimes we make it hard. People will twist the Bible to convince you that you can lose something. Well, then you never had it. You can't lose it, first of all, because it's not yours to lose. God is the one who has it. It is his salvation. David says, look, there's joy that comes with that, but I have lost the joy. And so David prays, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Here's why God works in your life. I think sometimes we forget this. God allows hardship in your life, and then God wants you to, God wants you to use that for his honor and his glory. Whatever it is that you've done wrong, that you've experienced, God, has, God is now saying, look, I want you to use that to teach others. Nobody's lived a perfect life. You don't have to worry about, I shouldn't. I need to be careful how I word this. No doubt people will judge you. But if you're more concerned and love God and are willing to say, you know what, I am a failure. Yes, I've committed sin. Yes, this has happened in my life. Let me tell you the great God and his forgiveness. Let me tell you, look, don't go down that path. It's a tragic path. And so when we get our heart and mind more concerned for others, we get less worried about what people will say about us. But the purpose of, of, of these things is now that I might be a teacher to transgressors. Why? That sinners should be converted. Verse number 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Why? Because he had the blood of Uriah on his hands. Verse number, you could argue he had the blood of his child on his hands as well, but, uh, uh, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. The only way that David could sing aloud of the righteousness was of God was for David to experience the forgiveness of God. Right? You can't go around living with guilt of, of sin on your shoulders and rejoice. And that's why I say, and this is what I'm going to close with here this evening, is that to find out if it's God or the devil on you that's bringing up your past, is this, is God bringing it up because you need to seek forgiveness? 
Or sometimes it's the devil bringing it up in order to establish shame in your life. And what I'm saying is that the difference between those is night and day. One is so that you might rejoice. Man, I'm so glad that I can get this right with God and experience the forgiveness of God. The other is to weigh you down and to make you ineffective as a witness for him. If I were to stand here this, morning, this evening and start as, long, as young as I can remember, to tell you the first time I stole a rope, the first time I stole a dollar, the first time I can remember lying, the first time I can remember cheating on a test. And I told you everything that I could think of that I've done wrong for the last 49 years. You'd be like, you got no business standing up there preaching a word. <laughs> what in the world? Right? Every sin you've ever committed you begin to think of all the things that you've done wrong, you're like, man, I got no business talking to anybody. I'm as bit of a failure and as much of a, of a, a disappointment that, that what have I got to give anybody? That's the devil. Or when you understand and you've brought it before God and you said, God, I plead the blood. I need to be washed because Man, I'm so unworthy. And God comes along and he promises not only forgiveness, but salvation in his word through our uh, faith in Jesus Christ. And I come along and I put my trust in that. And then comes this great joy that, man, I'm glad I don't have to live under that. I'm glad God's not holding, me against, holding that against me. And the reason why I don't tell you everything I've ever done is because you might hold it against me. And you got to decide, well, I need to decide how much of this I need to tell and how much of this I need to use as an illustration and how much of this maybe I shouldn't. And I don't know what the, what the balance of that is, but I do know that the forgiveness of God brings us to a place where I say, look, I have nothing to be ashamed of. Why? Because I am a sinner, yes, but I'm washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. And God says he makes me white, absolutely pure and holy before him. Not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. And that's what repentance is, is acknowledging that sin and saying, man, I need the forgiveness that only God can give. Am I a sinner? Absolutely. But I have an amazing God. And it's not just of acknowledging the sin, but we see that of turning from it. In verse number 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Right? We can praise him. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else will I give it. Thou desirest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God. This is the key part of this verse, the, this uh, passage. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And it's just like what we were saw with the pastor when he was in the book of Jonah, that here, regardless of the sin, God has created laws that says, you know what? If you've got a broken and contrite heart, in other words, you, you're sincere. Contrite means I'm turning from it. Recognize that I'm a sinner and I'm turning from that sin. God says, now that I recognize. That I forgive. Put money in the plate, not impressed. Make a promise to go to church, not going to do it for you. Going to be better to people, not going to have any effect with you and God. But the brokenness of your heart, God says, now that I recognize. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I ask Miss Cindy to come and play for us. I don't know your heart condition but I want to give you the opportunity. I'm just going to ask you to play anything you want to play when you're ready. The Lord's spoken to your heart. You want to come to the altar. It's open to you. But this is what it takes to have forgiveness with God. I'm so grateful for his love, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Will you play for us, Miss Cindy?
well, it's not what I thought the Lord was going to give me for a Thanksgiving Sunday. I thought the Lord would give me something about Thanksgiving, but he didn't. So I just shared what the Lord laid on my heart. I hope it's been a blessing for you. Um, but we are going to have a special service on Tuesday. I want to encourage you to come as we thank the Lord. He's worthy of so much thanks. And I want to encourage you to come out on Tuesday night. Remember our pastor's family, especially this time for uh, Brother Elmer in the hospital and his, his family. And uh, just, uh, Lord, give them comfort at this time. They're asking for prayer, and uh, uh, he's a mighty God. And uh, So praise him. Let's encourage one another. I'm going to ask you to stand together. We're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. And uh, so I'm going to ask Brother Tracy if you would have us dismissed this evening, please.